Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Curious Competitor Podcast. Uh, our guest today is Devin McConnell. He is a high-performance director currently uh, with the Arizona Coyotes. Devin and I crossed paths uh, when he was the director of performance and reconditioning coach with, New- with the New Jersey Devils. Unfortunately, I had uh, a pretty nasty finger, uh, finger surgery there, so we spent quite a bit of time together and then really cut his teeth in hockey as the head of hockey performance uh, with UMass Lowell. How long were you at UMass? I, was it nine years I saw? Just about nine years. Yep. I, I, I took nine. a look over on, I did some serious R&D on LinkedIn um, and was able to find that. So uh, I'm very excited to, uh, to talk with Devin today as part of a, a sort of a physical development series that we're doing here on the podcast. Um, most importantly, and I want to preface everything uh, before today, one of the things, Dev, and you can take this as a comment because I mean it as one, I thought you did a phenomenal job doing your job, getting me ready to re-enter the lineup, you know, physically. Um, but they're the greatest coaches I've had in the physical realm always tie in this element that, uh, you know, physical development and physical performance and physical growth very much has a, a mental, emotional, spiritual component. Um, you always led with a certain open-mindedness. You always led with uh, an importance on, I call it leveraging the placebo effect. Like the placebo effect is very real and studied. So why not discuss what exactly it is we're trying to do um, and and bring in that element of hyper belief in what we're doing. Um, so when you look at, you've obviously spent a lot of time in school learning, you know, the biomechanics, you study, you know, the sport of hockey now more closely maybe than you ever have, uh, as I'm sure your goal is every year you work in hockey. Um, but when you think of your greatest assets as a high performance director, like what makes you, you, and how are you uniquely able to help athletes in a way, um, that you feel separates you from the rest of the field? Yeah, well, I, I, first off, I appreciate you saying that. Um, you know, I, I think for me, you know, I, one of the really important sort of concepts for me um, is, and you kind of touched on it, um, and so I'm, gl- I'm glad it came through when we, when we work together, is, is sort of that, that human connection. And there's a quote um, that I kind of live by personally and professionally, and it's, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I've always, I've always, I've always been taught that. And I've always really believed that. And I think that, I don't know if it's something that's unique to me in this field. I think there are a lot of people that, that um, kind of work in my space that, um, you know, ultimately I think to be good, you know, as a strength coach or sports scientist or, or, you know, whatever hat that I'm kind of wearing, um, you, you have to be able to get people to buy in. And the reality that really comes down to communication and relationships. And if people believe that you have their best interests at heart, And you can, the other thing that I think is really important is you can explain why you're asking them to do what you're asking them to do, especially in the professional setting, right? Like at the end of the day, um, you know, the, the college setting and the pro setting are very different because in the college setting, you know, at the end of the day, if I say, this is what we're going to do, um, you know, I hold the hammer and the player is the nail. And I never, I never operated that way, but that's the reality. Like in the college setting, that, that just is the reality it's the total opposite in the NHL. You didn't have to do anything that I asked you to do or, or any of the programs I designed for you. Um, but you believed in what I was selling to you. Um, and so I think that, you know, again, I don't know that I'm unique in that, in, in this space, but I think that that's something that, that I work hard at trying to be good at because I think ultimately I I don't have much of a chance for success. Um, if I can't get our players, uh, to, to believe in me and to, you know, to honestly, to believe that I, that I care about them as more than just hockey players too. And I think that's an important concept that gets lost in pro sports a lot is that, um, you know, yeah, it's a cutthroat business, but we're all still humans. We're all still people, uh, regardless of, you know, who's paying your, you know, you're cutting your paycheck and, and what your role in the organization is, um, we're still people. And then, you know, and it's, it's the same motivations for everybody. Yeah, I think at a, on a human level, you want to be respected and you want to be seen, right? And so, you know, unfortunately, a lot of your work in, in the NHL as a strength coach, a heavy load of it, particularly in season, is with the injured guys and with scratches, right? Healthy scratches. And, and a lot of these players are going through, you know, particularly tough scenarios. And, and, you know, sometimes I remember as a player, I just had to clear some of that up. 
you know, I, I, maybe I found out after warmups, I wasn't playing. I thought I was right. Um, you know, scenarios like that. And, and now you've got to be, uh, you know, Hey Connor, I know you're upset. Um, but I really think it'd be in your best interest to grab a workout right now. We want to, you know, throw some heavy weight around, you know, are you open to it? And even just that inviting of the conversation to, you know, tip your cap to what you're going through. I was going through professionally. Um, your open-mindedness was contagious. And, and I agree. I, I think that that is such an important part. That's difficult. It, it's a, it's a skill. It takes practice in, in learning how to connect with people and, and bring it into um, the day to day. So I just wanted to say, you know, above all, you know, thanks for that. And it definitely made a lot more fun, you know, when I was in New Jersey coming to work every day, um, you know, whether I was spending more time with you than I wanted to or not. Um, but let's talk a little bit about your game seven, because, you know, I, we just came off the back of it and, you know, I kind of promised our listener, uh, some, some answers. I get a lot of questions on how I handle an off season. Uh, it's unique to me, uh, but I always think it's interesting uh, when a when a pro hockey player comes to you, you know, for the summer and hands over the keys to the car and says, you know, Devin McConnell, um, you know, I'm Connor Carrick, you know, I've been in the NHL, you know, this would be my ninth year pro, uh, but I want my tenth year to be my best year yet, right? Where do we start? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think again, there's a lot of context to that because it it you know you mentioned something there. You know, I'm a ninth year pro. I'm going into year ten. Um, I'm probably going to have a slightly different conversation with you than with an incoming prospect or a, a guy, you know, in his second year. Um, but it's for, for either guy, honestly, it's going to start with, okay, what do you, you tell me, what do you need to get better at? Right. I, I want to start with that. I want to lead the, have you lead the discussion a little bit and I want to find out what's important to you. And um, part of that's going to be trying to figure out, okay, what are some of the, the individual um, prescriptive pieces that, that, um, that I need to include. Um, because again, at, you know, at this level, like you're, you're a grown adult, you're, you know, you, you get to decide what's right for your career and for your body. Um, and I need to be supportive of that. That's, that needs to be my role more than anything is I'm here to help you get to where you need to get to. So I need to hear that from you. Uh, but at the same, at the same time, that also helps me steer things a little bit towards some of the things that, that, um, that maybe I, I believe are really important or, um, you know, maybe organizationally really important, right? Um, you know, how is this team going to play? What is the, the coaching staff looking for, for, you know, um, our style of play? Um, what are we organizationally trying to develop? Um, so it's going to start with a, a question and a conversation to understand where are you coming from? Um, and then again, like, you know, with a, with a guy like you, um, who's been, has been in the league for a long time, is, you know, play pro hockey for a long time. And especially, you know, very literally with you with somebody that's very, very intelligent from a training perspective, like you, you could be, you could do my job when you're done playing. Like you could be a strength coach in the national hockey league. You could be a performance director because you really have a very innate understanding of training and how to develop and how to improve. Um, so I want to learn from you more than anything. Uh, I want to find out where you're at. Um, and then have a discussion around those things and, and start to put a plan in place that's going to hopefully satisfy what what I believe is a professional need to occur from a training per, um, in a training program and where we're at in an off season, what we what we need to prepare for, but also make sure that we're taking care of the things that that you believe in and that, you know, are important um, for your career, and for your body and how you play and all those things. So holistically. I guess we can get, we can, we can, we can stay abstract and talk about um, you know, some of the open-mindedness around, you know, programming and things like that. So for example, you said something uh, that's important to me that I've actually answered through direct messages and things like that for young players who ask me how to handle an off season. Um, at some point you have to tip your cap to how your coach wants to play. Uh, so for example, I remember, you know, Barry Trotz uh, was hired in Washington and I was a younger pro at the time and he made it very clear based off the first year. I was around for his second camp. That first year was brutal. Like physically the skating demand was so high. So that second year, non-negotiable, um, whether I want to get faster, stronger, whatever, I needed to be ready for training camp for that skating volume. So sometimes 
Uh, you, you and I can talk about sports science, what might be perfect on paper um, in terms of getting ready for, you know, an explosive anaerobic sport, uh, but come, you know, training camp, there's a, a certain robustness and a, and a general, you know, preparedness to play and handle the stresses of that unique camp uh, that do take precedent. Because one of the things that I've always um, tried to hone in on is I think a lot of players get focused on, I want to get ready for the season, right? I want to get ready for the, for the long haul. And I, I get that. But one of the things that always kept me a little bit sharper was like, I'm trying to get ready for the first week, right? So I'm, I'm not going to toe dip. I'm not going to wait for my puck skills to arrive on day eight. Um, I'm not going to let, you know, the first couple of days uh, kind of get me ready for, you know, the season to come. If it's a heavy camp coming, I, I'm going to be ready. Yeah, without question. I mean, that's, uh, I feel like I'm doing the player a disservice if I'm not preparing them for, for the demands of camp, whether or not uh, that is going to be reflective of the way the game is actually going to be played, you know, three weeks down the road um, or how, what practice is going to look like, or, um, you know, and that's, that's a separate side of my job is having the discussions you know, up the chain with the coaching staff and the GM and, and trying to mold, help mold. Well, if this is how you want to play, um, this is the style that we want to be. This is, you know, X, Y, and Z, you know, this is the workload and the, you know, the sports science around what camp should be like. And there's always give and take. And there's, um, you know, I find that the best coaches have a very intrinsic understanding of the things that, that I'm going to try to use technology and data to, to analyze. But at the end of the day, if camp is going to be like this and I'm not preparing you for camp, if I'm preparing you for what it's going to look like three weeks down the road, but like you need to, you need to compete and perform and win a job in camp. Well, I'm not, I'm, I'm doing you a disservice if I'm not preparing you for that. Even if that means we're going to have to fix some things on the back end or, or, you know, work around some issues down the road. Um, we very much need to prepare you for, like you said, for day one. Uh, so I think that's a really, that's another really important concept and probably something I didn't, um, I didn't understand as well early in my career um, where I did try to maybe um, over, you know, kind of, kind of over science things. And so, well, this is the exact right, you know, by the textbook uh, way to have, you know, that this is what the game's going to look like and this is how to prepare and this is how to periodize things. And it's like, yep, but you're going to get punched in the mouth for the first four days and I didn't prepare you for that. So I didn't do my job. Right. That's, it kind of comes back to that. And it's a, it's a balancing act between the two. So it's, that's where some of the challenge lies in that, especially that late kind of late off season period is trying to balance those things. Well, I think that reminds me a little bit of, you know, the title of your book, which is something I left out of the intro, um, you know, by accident was, uh, you did write a book intent, a practical approach to applied sports science for athletic development. And this is a little bit of that practicality side. Like, what are the demands going to be? Uh, we can live in a theoretical world of what, you know, might be best, um, you know, for athletic development. But, you know, at some point, I'm going to have to show up to camp and I'm the coach's property now. Uh, and they're going to handle, you know, the, the practice schedule however they need. Um, but I want to focus on that word intent, because this is something as a professional, you made the comment, maybe I could, you know, after all this time, and I've worked with some really high-end strength coaches and, and performance coaches, and I've been able to accumulate a lot of knowledge. But the number one thing that I really appreciated that you focused on was if there is not an absolute belief and intent that we are trying to change our body for the better with whatever we're doing, the prescription is irrelevant, right? So um, let's use a, a stretch we would use often, right? We would do a lot of hip work. Um, what was it called? Uh, the FRM or whatever, where it was the 30 oh, second stretch FRC stuff. Yeah. FRC, yeah, yeah. right. Where you would, you would kind of lay into a stretch. Let's call it an internal rotation for 30 seconds. Uh, you would press down basically in one direction for 10, press in the other for 10 and then finish the stretch for another 10. You can sit there for 60 seconds and totally camp out. And you wouldn't know the difference cause you're not inside my body. Um, but if I'm really going to sit here for this minute with every intention to improve the mobility of my hip, I have a chance of doing that because it's difficult to do even with the intent uh, to improve mobility. It's difficult to get faster, even if I'm purposely trying to do it. Um, can you highlight why exactly that 
from a, a, a physiological standpoint or just a, a common sense standpoint of why that element is so important, that, that belief element and that purposeful intent that I am entering into this period of difficulty because most training isn't exact, exactly, uh, you know, going for a walk in the park. Um, why am I doing what I'm doing? Yeah. Well, and that's, that phrase right there is key. Why are you doing what you're doing? Um, I, I'm a firm believer in, I, I'm, I'm firmly against the idea of doing work for work sake. And I think there's a tremendous amount of work for work sake. And we are, we are, in, in we, are game, we are going to transfer, we are going to change the conversation and talk about the 14 to 20 year old sort of trainee who, who I think is the major culprit of parents doing work for work. Yeah. Right. So I had, a, I had a parent come up to me, well-meaning. Uh, and I, I think this is a tee up for you, but well-meaning uh, we're in the gym in Chicago this summer. Uh, his kid was coming to the gym five days a week, working super hard and asked me, he's like, Hey Connor. So like, you know, what do you do? Um, you know, for training, like when you leave here, I was like, other than the on ice, like nothing like th this is it. Like I do my best here. He's like, so you're not running like any hundred yard shuttles. And I'm not saying that those don't have a place, but I'm like, I honestly just asked him to watch his kid. I'm like, watch your kid right now. Like he's in one. He he's really working. He's really breathing. Um, he's going to need a chance to kind of recover. Cause he's got to do this again tomorrow. Um, and so it'd be beneficial for him to not do this totally impaired, uh, you know, from a recovery standpoint, and then do that again tomorrow. And oh, by the way, also perform the hundred meter sprints, super gassed. I'm like, at some point, you know, you become what you practice and your kid is just practicing doing stuff out of survival. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it's, and again, it goes back to why are we doing what we're doing? Like, what are we trying to improve? And I think, you know, I think a lot of people with best intentions, they don't understand that training, high end training should be very very focused and very directed. You're not just trying to get tired. Anybody can just make you tired or you can just, uh, you can go out and run a marathon and bag yourself. Like that doesn't make you a faster hundred meter sprinter, right? If that's what you're trying to be better at. Um, so it goes back to that, that idea of, of work for work sake. I'll tell like a, a quick, uh, a quick story. I had a, a player when I worked at Lowell, um, who is one of my all time favorite kids, one of the hardest work he's ever had. Um, but after his, uh, freshman year, he went home and instead of following the training program that we had lined up, that was going to, you know, this week led to next week, to next week, to next week, to when they came back for camp to the six weeks, we we're going to train to preseason to first week of camp, you know, it was very prescriptive and very step-by-step. -step. He went home and, and went in a different direction and he trained at, you know, there was a, a school near him and he went and trained uh, at their strength and conditioning center with their coach and worked really hard. Like, really hard. I had no question whatsoever, but he, he, he got on a different horse and went a totally different direction. So when he came back, even though he had worked really hard, he hadn't worked really hard at the, the right things. Um, and so he ended up, you know, essentially just really be behind the eight ball relative to, to everybody else on the team. Cause he hadn't kind of followed the same, the same route. He had worked hard, but he hadn't worked smart, right. By following that plan. Um, and, and it comes back to that idea of intent. You can, you can work really hard and get really sore and get really tired, but what is the purpose behind what you're trying to improve? It, you know, talking about the, that, that dad and that kid, um, you can go and run, you know, hundred meter repeats over and over and over and get really, really tired. But is that going to make you faster and recover quicker so that when you're on the ice, you can sprint uh, down and back, change, recover while you're on the bench, get back out, do it again. Maybe not. So you've worked really hard, but with the wrong intent uh, and the wrong focus, and you haven't actually improved at what you're trying to improve behind or what you're trying to improve. And so again, that comes back to that idea of intent and having a focus and an understanding of what you're trying to improve and that everything, you know, one of the things I tell my players all the time, every single thing that I'm going to ask them to do, every single thing in our training program has a, has a reason. And if you have a question about that uh, and you want to know what is the purpose of this, uh, if I can't answer that question, if I can't tell you how this is going to help you achieve your goal, then we'll get rid of it. We'll take, I'll, I'll apologize. I'll take it out of the program. We won't do it again. 
because there needs to be a reason behind everything that we're doing. Otherwise, again, we're just, we're just doing work for work's sake and get tired. And especially at the, at the highest level, I mean, you can speak to this better than anybody. There's, you know, people think as a, as a professional athlete, well, you've got, you've got so much free time and so much, you can just do anything. You, the, the amount of free time and energy available to you is so minuscule in a day because of, because of the recovery that's necessary and the absolute, you know, um, the absolute level that you have to compete and play at physically and psychologically and emotionally, um, the time that you would spend with me, like I have to make sure that every second of that time, that not a second of it is wasted, um, or, or overused. I want to do the absolute least possible to get the result for you because your job is not training. Your job is playing. And if I'm taking energy away from you in training, that is not productive, then again, I'm doing a disservice to you. And it comes back to that idea of why are we doing what we're doing? I agree. And I, I want to, I guess, add specifics to a, a little bit of what we're talking about. So let's talk about in season training, uh, from a professional standpoint. So context we're you know, in an 82, uh, you know, game season, I'm in the HL right now. I think we play, I don't even actually know how many games we play. I think it's 76. It's a lot of hockey point blank. We played three games and three, uh, nights. This it was really two and a half. Cause it was a seven o'clock game, seven o'clock game, 2 PM. We flew home Monday. My wife asked for dinner, asked me to help make dinner on Monday night. And I was like, listen, my brain is off. It has left the building and is no longer with me. I think it's already partially asleep. I'm going to give you whatever is left over to make dinner, but I'm, I'm telling you, you're going to need to instruct me on what I'm doing. Cause I'm, I'm, I'm just bare right now. I'm, I'm trying to recover. Right. goes back to kind of that energy piece. Um, training wise, I would say warm up every day. You allocate about at least 15 to 20 minutes, I think is a, a good number. Um, there's a healthy amount of static stretching in there. A lot of it is sort of um, proprioceptive uh, movement to try to become coordinated, frankly, that, you know, that, that go from that waking up out of bed feeling to uh, a core temperature and, and a bodily awareness where I'm like, I'm ready. So for me, a lot of times it looks like um, lunging, squatting, you know, crawling, uh, some jumping or running if I'm feeling up to it. Um, and then we'll jump on the ice and then roughly given there's two to four games a week, I would say there's two to four times a week where we're trying to load tissue from a strength perspective. Does this all sound right to kind of what our cadence was in, in New Jersey? Yeah, essentially. Yeah. I mean, I would totally agree with you. Some type of, some type of, and we can come back to this concept because I think it's actually really important probably for your, some of the, the folks out there listening, the 14 to 19 year old, you know, players, but some type of structured warm up. Um, you know, typically our, our tissue loading, if we want to kind of call it that our strength development would be, um, something post game. Um, and then maybe, you know, depending on what a schedule looks like one other time per week where we're trying to, you know, we would, we would be focused more on speed power. Um, but you know, what people might look into the weight room and, and think of, Oh, that's a, that's a lift. The team is lifting. The players are lifting. So you're getting a couple, a couple exposures, um, to strength or speed work, you're getting hopefully a daily exposure to the, the warm up piece, like you're talking about. But I actually think that that piece is is underutilized and under understood uh, with how important it is. Um, but yeah, that would be that's kind of the daily cadence. There's just little kind of little touches almost every day um, is what it looks now, like. What is, in now, what is exactly our goal? And and it, and it is, I think, transferable for a lot of athletes. Uh, listening to this podcast because there are a lot of hockey players playing similar schedules like these junior leagues they play a lot of hockey and they I get asked this question like do you lift heavy in season do you sprint in season um what are the goals because in my mind I've been instructed as as really there's two sort of goals when we're training three one is get ready for the player practice right if we're going to include the warm-up piece um, and I would even consider the cool down piece as part of that. Cause you're just trying to get ready for the game. That's in 72 hours. Right. So, uh, that's, that's the one part of sports science that I think I've really taken a liking to of late in terms of whether it's breath work, um, some of the, you know, meditative work that I actually consider, you know, really just part of my training. Um, but I was always told we're trying to introduce, you know, micro stress 
to limit the detraining effect of going through a season. So in layman's terms, like you're just trying to stay strong and powerful as you were when you came in the off season, you had four to six days of training a week, let's say. And then also there's this component that I think's underutilized and, and not talked about enough training can elicit sort of a biochemistry effect. That's very conducive to overall bodily recovery, which is a lot of people think, yes, training can be damaging in the short term, but it can kind of elicit a hormonal response that can be very beneficial to um, health and vibrance and, you know, energetic robustness as well as physical robustness over the course of a season. Yeah, no, I, I would, I would agree with all those pieces. I think, I think the warm up piece, like you said, is yes, it's warm up. Yes. It's, it's getting prepared to, uh, to practice. It's, it's, you know, taking your body, taking your joints through a full range of motion. It's, it's kind of checking all of those boxes, but where I think a lot of players miss the boat is that, you know, if you think, if you think let's, let's say 10 minute warm up six days a week. Okay. That's 60 minutes a week. That's an hour a week, every week of training time. And it doesn't mean that you're in there smashing weights and you're setting PRs, but you know, and you mentioned it as you talked kind of briefly talked through what your warm up kind of looks like. You go through some of those range of motion things and the tissue temperature things, and then you finish with one or two, you know, max effort, explosive actions, jumps, short sprints. That's, you know, we use the term microdosing. Like that's, if you're touching on that five, six days a week, if you get two, you know, 10 yard sprints five days a week, that's actually accumulating a pretty robust volume of high intensity neurologically um, stimulating activity that you can take advantage of. If you think about uh, the amount of time you can warm up over the course of the year. So that's the, that's the first piece. It's, we kind of call that microdosing. And then, yeah, I think there's a, there's just a basic, I hate to say maintain strength because I think, especially for younger players, even in a crazy schedule, I think you can actually, if you're really smart about volumes and intensities, if players, a lot of players, um, I believe are, are uninformed and think that lower intensity, lighter weight, but maybe relatively higher volume is, is more appropriate in season. And I'm actually the opposite. I believe, um, relatively high intensity, heavy stuff, but very, very small volumes. We might do a post game lift for us. Um, it might be two sets of two sets of two, two sets of one split squats, um, with 250, 300 pounds, depending on who the player is and what they're capable of, you know, not, not a maximal effort, um, kind of, uh, exercise or lift, but something that, you know, we would consider 80% of what they're capable of. And, and it's, it's, you touch it, you touch two reps and you get out of there. Uh, so you're trying to stimulate, um, that neurological adaptation, you're trying to maintain or, or even d develop some, some strength. And, and I think it goes a long ways to, um, mitigating, uh, injury risk as well, because you're, you're exposing tissue in a very small, very small window to, um, really high level stressors. If the game is the highest level stress that your tissue is going to go through, um, then you're, I, I believe you're more likely to break down over time. If you're able to elicit high levels of stress in very small quantities over time in training so that the game is now not necessarily the highest level of tissue stress you go, go through, then I think you're, you're protecting yourself. Um, and then I think, yeah, I do believe there's a, there's absolutely a hormonal response that is conducive to overall recovery and tissue healing and all of these things that again, in season is so crucial and is such an underappreciated piece of the training program, because if you're not actively trying to recover post practice, post game, post training for the next game, you know, the next preparation for the next game starts at the end of today's practice or today's game, right? Everything you're doing from that moment on is leading into that game. So if you're not taking care of that piece of the puzzle as well, if you're not thinking about that, then you're missing a big window. Yeah. One of the things that I think has been a transformative in my training in the off season for sure, but definitely in season where, you know, the lights are really on and that's really as a player where you're evaluated is, you know, from a supplementation standpoint, right? If you weren't getting enough B vitamins in your diet, you might add more. Pretty simple. Um, the pro hockey schedule 
is designed, you will become more unhealthy over the course of a season. You, there are late nights. You're spending a lot of time under blue light, uh, high chronic levels, you know, of stress, both from an inflammation standpoint, uh, just because of, you know, mental stress of the season, but also physical, you're getting in like many car crashes everywhere, all over the rank every night. So on the other end, you need to supplement very smartly and accurately with these lifestyle habits um, that can push you towards health uh, more drastically. And that's where, you know, I've really come, come, you know, become obsessed with the cool down, right? Every kid kind of knows uh, they walk into the stadium, get the headphones on, they're bobbing their head. They got M&M going 50 cent, whatever. They're fired up. They're ready to rock. It's game time. You know, no one teaches the four, seven, eight breath, you know, before bed. Uh, so you can come down after all that, you know, stimulating activity and, and maintain this, this ramped up, you know, uh, pregame feeling uh, that's so desirable on, on game one and hard to find on game 55 in Columbus on a Tuesday and it's raining, right? And you're on the end of a, of a back-to-back. Um, so I do want to transition a little bit. I, I want to, I think we've covered and, and given some insight on the pro athlete, which I, I know people are curious about. Uh, but a lot of our listeners uh, are youth athletes. And I know I was so hungry, you know, for this information when I was a kid. I really think your a player's uh, routine can look very similar from, say, for example, age 14 to, you know, 23. I always joke, you know, I really went pro at 14. I was in the gym, you know, five days a week in the summer, three days a week uh, in season, you know, from age 14 on. I played the national team development program. We had a very aggressive, um, you know, physical routine. Practices were often two hours long. We'd have a full lift, you know, three, four times a week from Olympic lifts uh, to, you know, your back squats. Most of it was one legged at the time. Um, you know, Daryl Nelson was a Mike Boyle guy who really liked, you know, a lot of the, the single legged stuff. Um, I've done, you know, some of the triphasic work that, you know, Cal Dietz and, and Ben Peterson are, are famous for. I really responded well to that. Um, but when you're dealing with athletes from ages 14 to 23, so let's call them, you know, the college group of kids that you were really dealing with, uh, all the way through to, you know, some of the prospects now for, for the Arizona Coyotes. What in your mind from a sports science standpoint should their off season breakdown look like from a Monday through Sunday? Yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah. I mean, I think if we're talking about off season, um, I think the idea is to work, work backwards, right. From the end goal. Again, you know, we talked about it earlier. Uh, if, if the end goal of preparation is basically training camp, say, okay, what are the demands here? What do we need? So we, we want to look at it, especially with those younger players from two perspectives. What are the, what, what are the demands for training camp or for the start of the season? Like, what am I going to need to be able to do? What do I want to look like physically and work backwards from that? Um, but then also from a developmental standpoint, um, I think some of the key developmental pieces for younger athletes um, is to, well, it really comes down to consistency, right? So that over the course of that week and that, that off season, um, being really consistent with training. Speed development, I believe, is absolutely paramount in today's game. Um, you know, if younger, younger athletes, like there, there certainly is a, a point in time where you're strong enough, strong is strong enough, right? Um, but for those younger developing athletes, developing um, sort of whole body holistic strength, what does that look like over the course of a week? You know, different coaches are going to have different philosophies. There's, there's no, there's, no exact way to do it. Uh, I'm in favor of sort of a Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday training split in an off season program, Wednesday being a recovery or regeneration session. Um, I think it's important to get time away from training time away from the rink. So I think it's important for guys, especially earlier in the summer and the off season to, to have a weekend. Um, and I think and this is maybe a little bit of a con- controversial take, but I think less time on the ice early in the off season um, is actually really important for uh, especially these younger developing athletes. You're on, you know, you're on the ice so much now. um, And, and and there's a, there's a point in time where that is the, that is the priority, but there's also needs to be a point in time that your physical development needs to be a priority. And and if you're, if you're on the ice six days a week, all summer long, um, your, your body doesn't have the ability to, physically develop the way you could 
if you um if you if you kind of took a backseat to that and and you made a point earlier that made me think is a, a concept that i think is really important it's this idea of filling buckets right in in the in season uh for example we do very little conditioning work because what happens every single day you're conditioning you're practicing you're playing you we don't need to fill that bucket that bucket's filled but what doesn't happen in the game is you know strength development okay we need to fill that bucket well the off season uh, and recovery pieces is, is huge too we need to fill the recovery bucket right um because everything you talked about well the off season's kind of the opposite right um we need to fill the bucket with stress in other areas so we're going to condition more uh we're going to do higher volume strength training we're going to do more uh speed development work these things so over the course of that four day work week, um, the way I like to structure things is Tuesday and Thursday tend to be your kind of um, bigger, uh, heavier, lower body power development, strength development days. Monday is more of a, a speed and upper body training day. And then Friday is more of a, um, again, upper body and more of a kind of a volume based day. And again, this is very general. Um, this can look different for different players at different points in their career, but that's kind of how I like to structure a training week. And then again, with that concept of kind of working, working backwards with the end goal in mind, what do you need to be able to do? If, if uh, the day one of camp, you need to look like X, then three weeks before that physically, what do you need to be able to do? And then three weeks before that, and three weeks before that, you get to the point of, okay, that's where I am today. So this is what training needs to start to look like to follow that roadmap. Yeah. And you, I, you know, at some point as a player in order to evolve, if you're showing up every day, you will practice the habits that you left the rink with yesterday. So sometimes a little bit of a break from the player that you were can help you become, grow into and metamorphosis into the player that you are becoming, right? Especially from a physical robustness standpoint. Like I deal with, a, I get a lot of questions on Instagram where kids, you know, are struggling, you know, to put weight on. Um, and that is a huge limiting factor for them, right? One of the things I, I want to highlight, I think it's really interesting. A lot of uh, the game is getting very skilled, right? Uh, and, and you're seeing kids now work with skill coaches four or five times a week, like you mentioned, Devin, in, in April and May, uh, which I was that kid. Like, I loved it. But what I can say is the physical robustness side of the game came very easy to me. What a lot of people don't recognize if, is if, you walk around an NHL locker room. These are big boys. Like these dudes are, are thick, they're strong, they're robust. And there are a very small few that are a little bit more frail that are unbelievably talented, unbelievably talented. And so one of my questions here is how do you differ or how do you work with two things? And I, I think that the answers might be tied up. How do you deal with the very talented athlete who's afraid of what the weight room will do to them because they've been sore. They don't feel good. They think that it will, it will harm their talent. Their proprioceptive skills will decrease. What conversation do you have with them or similar to the hardworking kid you had that, you know, went West on his own program. Um, how do you deal with the kid where actually their obsession with the weight room? Cause I was this player at one point uh, is hindering them. You're, you're actually not training on the ice enough. You're, you're overvaluing too late in the summer what we're doing, right? Because there was one point uh, in an off season where I was training six days a week or even eight, nine, 10 days in a row. And I'd be on the ice all those days. I was just trying to do more of everything, volume at everything. Yeah, because I right. didn't want to lose the strength gains that I had gained all summer. But I knew camp was starting and we were going to be on the ice you know, if you count pregame skate eight times in six days. So I would just do all of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so how do you handle that trade off? Yeah. Uh, it's, what a good question. Um, well, I think it, again, it starts with a conversation, right. And understanding where that, where either of those people are coming from, right. The, the super, super, super talented kid that um, has never needed the weight room has never, uh, doesn't see it as being something that's beneficial or, or potentially even hindering. Well, let's have a conversation. Let's understand. I, I need to understand where they're coming from. What are, the, what are their hangups around these things? Has anybody ever 
again, it comes back to why, like, has anybody ever explained to them the why behind training? Maybe, uh, and I've had this, uh, actually, this exact example that, you know, their, their understanding of training, their, their worldview of it, of, of the weight room is, you know, came from a place of work for work sake. It's just about grinding and tired and sore. And that's what it's a, a mental toughness thing. There's no understanding of whether there was or wasn't there. He didn't understand a purpose behind it besides that. And it was like, well, I'm going to go score goals because that's what I like to do. And that's what I'm good at. And I don't want to do that because it hurts. And every time I'm sore, I'm not any better. If that's where he's coming from, then I need to have the conversation around. I told, I couldn't agree more with you. That's work for work's sake. That's counterproductive. That's not what we're trying to do. There's might be a time and a place where you're tired and you're sore, but we're going to do that at this point in time in the off season, not at this point in time, because that's when you need to be focused more on your skill development and on the ice, et cetera. Um, on the flip side, the guy that, you know, realistically needs to spend less time in the weight room and more time on their skill development. Well, it's the same kind of conversation. And that's the, the conversation piece from a sports science standpoint. Like one of the things that I try to do is I try to break down or, or we try to break down what are the player's strengths and weaknesses from a physical development standpoint, from a skill development standpoint, from a technique standpoint, and understand like what is the lowest common denominator? What is the thing? You know, one of our key performance indicators is, is sprint speed, is skating speed. Um, if a player is uh, below a certain threshold for us in our organization, then we want to understand, well, why? Why are you slow? Is this a strength component? And we have ways to assess that and test that. Nope, this guy is strong. He's strong as an ox. It's not that. Okay. Is this a um, skating technique standpoint? Like a, literally, can we teach him how to accelerate better and it would take care of that? Um, and, and we try to whittle down to the bottom sort of rung of this ladder and understand like basically who's, whose area is it that this this player needs to focus on is it a strength development standpoint all right come over here with the strength coaches is it a skill development standpoint okay we're going to work with our with our skating coach for this is this a, uh, an equipment issue like is this something where our equipment staff could come in and make an adjustment to the skate and take away whatever the limitation is so it's it's a conversation piece with those both those players to understand where they're coming from and then try to uh, gain an understanding or, or help them understand where we're coming from. But then it's also trying to boil things down to basically their lowest common denominator. Like what is the thing that is limiting you? If it's a skating skill component and you are really strong. Okay. Let's take your six hours a week in the weight room. Let's cut it to three and let's spend some more time on the ice. If it's the opposite and it's like, yeah, you are super skilled and super talented, but every time, you know, somebody looks at you, you fall over because you're so weak. Well, you know what? You might score three or four more goals this year if you can stand in front of the net and tip pucks. So let's work a little bit in this area. So it's all comes, it all comes back to trying to understand where they're coming from and what is the thing that they actually need. So in light of that, in, in, in light of why are we doing what we're doing, what is something that you would advise, and you've been around a lot of pro hockey players now, what is a common pitfall that you would just wish pro hockey players in season or off season, the first thing that comes to mind, please stop doing this to yourself physically because it's sabotaging your, your frankly, your well being, your energy, and definitely your performance. Um, I, I think honestly it goes back to the, and, and this isn't specific to a player, but it's kind of the culture of the game. I believe it's again, it's kind of a work for work sake mentality. Listen, we're, you know, it, hockey's still a, a blue collar sport, right? You know, it's changing and the, the, you know, the demographics are changing, but like, it's a, we're, if you're a hockey player, like you're a hard worker, right? For the most part, you're a high character, hardworking individual. You want to put work in, you, you don't feel right. If you're not pushing and grinding, that's how we are. It's in our DNA as hockey players. But sometimes the most important thing that you can do, um, thinking about NHL players, sometimes the most important thing you can do is learn how to recover how to relax, how to call, how to bring yourself down post game, how to get good sleep, um, how to unwind, you know, the mental unwinding aspect. You talk about all of the stress and the emotion behind everything that we do and, and um, not to, you know, for, forget about the, the physical um, stress, but just the, the emotional 
toll that the game takes on you in a, in a NHL season or a professional hockey league season. Um, I think guys grinding when they need to be resting and, and as soft as that might sound, I think it's a, it's a huge thing that can help a lot of players. Um, if they can understand, yes, there's absolutely a time to hit the gas pedal. Um, but again, it's this, I want to hit the gas pedal and hit hundred miles an hour. And then I want to hit the brakes and be at zero. I don't want to tap the gas and stay at 70 and, and then 30 and just kind of grind away in the middle, all, all or nothing or recover. Like that's where I want guys to be. What are some of your favorite recovery techniques? Yeah, I think, I think the way that I try to think about recovery and regeneration from a, a modality standpoint or technique standpoint, what are you trying to recover from? Right. Um, if you're trying to, if you need to recover, um, from, uh, sympathetic, emotional, uh, neurological drive, I think, um, meditation, I think, uh, diaphragmatic breathing, I think, um, uh, listening to uh, Baroque classical music are all really good ways to help to shift into a parasympathetic state and calm down and relax. If we're trying to recover um, muscle damage, uh, as an example, you've got back to back game and, and uh, you just need to try to repair tissue as quickly as possible or, or blunt the negative effect of muscle damage, then, you know, uh, cold tub hydrotherapy, those types of modalities can be beneficial. Um, so it's kind of depends on what you're trying to recover, but those are some big pieces. I think, I think one of the most important things you can do is figure out what helps as simple as the sounds, figure out what helps you sleep because at the end of the day, sleep is the biggest recovery tool you have. And it's really challenging, um, post game, post caffeine, post everything, uh, you know, to turn that down and be able to get sleep. But the players that figure out how to do that, whether it's getting away from blue light, whether it's meditation, whether it's breathing, um, it's different for everybody, but finding ways to turn, turn the system down and get to sleep, I think is probably the, the biggest thing. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll put this in there. Like one of the best recovery techniques that I've started to implement is just try not to make the big mistake whatever that means. So, you know, maybe I want to have some, some sugar, the sugar dragons acting up. It's like, have a couple pieces of dark chocolate. Like don't fight it all night. So that all of a sudden, you know, as soon as my wife goes to bed, I go and crush 15 cookies, you know, or, or, or when I get home from a flight at three in the morning and I'm just ravaging the cupboard because, you know, willpower is low. Uh, and I've been denying myself for so long. Um, alcohol use, you know, NHL players drink, pro hockey players drink. It's what it is. Uh, is it ideal for athletic performance? Not one bit. I don't think there's anything positive about it from a physiological standpoint. Um, if you want to have one, fine. Stop at one. If you want to have two, fine. Stop at two. Let's leave the conversation there. Like you don't need to go to the Halloween party um, and be hung over for three, four days uh, because you're going to play in that time and guys are trying to hit you that night too. Um, and so players, you know, can, can do with that information what they want. Uh, just for me, I, I've noticed a huge difference that, you know, at the end of a weekend, you know, just keep that exhale within some sort of balance, you know, don't totally blow the lid off. And then anytime I can combine the couple, um, anytime I can, you know, if I can do meditative work, uh, with some extended breath work where maybe my biochemistry will change due to the, you know, oxygen CO2 change. Uh, that's a plus if I can include a family element, right? Because we do spend a lot of time away from our families. If I can include my wife and, and do a meditation together where all of us sleep better, or, you know, I have a son now, you know, Charlie, he's not watching me too close, uh, at nine months. He's, he's, he cares what I'm doing, but he does have his own plan, but you know, someday maybe include him, right? So that there's this, um, sort of trifecta, you know, of, of compounding effects, uh, for youth athletes, what's something that comes to mind in terms of sabotage? Um, probably nutrition is a big one for, for, for youth athletes, you know, talk about kind of the, the sugar dragon, um, for sure. I think that that's a, that's a big one. Um, I think honestly, I mean, if you think about all that we're learning about and better understanding around, you know, mental health and stress and anxiety, 
and how it affects kids. Like it's, it's no different. Like kids learn it. Kids need to learn how to, or, or be, be helped to learn how to kind of turn things off and find balance. Right. I think that's, and that's probably a more of a, again, a, a hockey culture and a society kind of conversation and a parenting conversation maybe, but, um, you know, uh, allowing kids to be kids, I think is, is really, really important. Um, but, but managing those things. And so, you know, nutrition for everybody is, is crucial. Um, and I think well, here, here, like, I'll share this, I'll share this about nutrition. Cause I think this is really interesting and I, I didn't really realize it till the problem was over. So I've dealt with, you know, what's considered an anxiety disorder since I was a kid. Um, you know, I remember I was, probably in second grade, a lot of kids like chew their shirt. It's their thing. You know, I would chew mine like all the way down to my belly button. Right. So if I looked like if I was wearing a great t-shirt, it looked like the top half of it was dipped in a pool. Right. So, you know, there was, there's this high strung, you know, tendency. Um, it, I would sweat a lot when I was in high school, I would sweat through the bed. Like I, my, my bed would be, you know, all filled with it. And then all of a sudden, um, you know, I started to really, take it easy on, you know, uh, gluten, sugar. I, I didn't drink much in high school, so that wasn't an issue. Um, and, uh, you know, dairy and I, I just started to, instead of focusing on eliminating the bad, I just really enjoyed the good, the meat, vegetables, you know, proper carbs, potatoes, some, some rice, things like that. And all of a sudden, like six months went by and I was like talking about it with Lexi, I'm like, I don't sweat when I sleep anymore. Um, and so I wasn't someone that I would consider to have by Western standards, a really bad diet. Uh, but what I knew and really caused the shift for me was I hadn't met anybody that had really invested in learning about nutrition and trying to bit by bit gently and with grace with themselves. Cause it's difficult when you first order a salad for lunch and you're not eat, used to eating a salad for lunch. It's difficult. I hear you. Um, but you, I haven't met anybody that's really tried it and said, no, nah, that's not for me. I didn't feel better. Yeah. No, I mean, a hundred percent. I mean, it's it, as cliche as it sounds like you are what you put in your body. Like you, it's just true. It's, it's, uh, so if you're putting high quality, you know, real food into your body, like that's what, that's what we're made. That's what we're designed to run off of. We're not designed to run off of processed carbohydrates and sugars. And we can, we do, but not optimally. And there's all of these downstream effects that, you know, people don't even realize, or, you know, you, you might not even realize or, or, or connect the dots that these things are connected to anxiety disorders and these, these issues. And these things can change sometimes uh, because of, because of what you're putting into your body, because it's just, again, you're, you're, we're not designed to run on chemicals and processed stuff. And there's going to be an impact to that when we do like it's, there just is. Um, and I think in our Western society and we become so accustomed to it that we don't, you know, I remember, you know, I, I don't eat or drink much dairy anymore. Um, and I grew up drinking, I drink a gallon of milk a day. And, and now if I drink a glass of milk, I mean, I'm, like I, I know that I feel awful and I just lived like that. We all just lived like that forever. And some people it's fine but for me, it wasn't, but I just didn't know because every day I drank milk. So every day I felt like that and I just became accustomed to it. It wasn't until I, I stopped or, or moderated it that I, I realized how it affected me. Right. And so I guess I invite our listener, you know, Devin and I aren't offering, you know, any particular nutritional advice other than to just evaluate maybe the programming you were handed, you know, from uh, our culture, society, your familial sort of lifestyle. Uh, I started uh, Food, What the Heck Should I Eat by Dr. Mark Hyman was a big eye opener for me. Uh, one of the first resources where uh, he went just aisle by aisle in the grocery store, your sort of your standard grocery store setup, and talked about what might be, you know, most nutritious, uh, sort of a good, better, best scenario. And also address just different sort of um, uh, common misconceptions about, you know, different health foods and things like that. Really helpful for me. Do you have any books that uh, or, or podcasts that you've really liked in the nutritional realm, either particularly for athletics or I, I always think this is interesting. Uh, you know, a lot of people will say like, oh, how, how should I eat 
you know, uh, for sport performance. And it's like, well, you know, we're, we're probably more human beings than we are athletes, but there are some divergences, but most of it's the same. Yeah, I, I agree. I think most of it, um, I, I, the, one of the, the book that comes to mind that, um, I always think is just fantastic. It's very, and it's very simple and very easy to read is, uh, it's called food rules by Michael Poland. And it's almost like a page of, you know, calendar page of the day, kind of, uh, kind of book where every, every page might oh, be I love those. Yeah, those are great. yeah, it's 150 pages or something. And it's like, Hey, don't, uh, if it's served through the, you know, the window of your car, it's, probably not that good for you. Right. And it's like, Oh yeah, like that kind of makes sense. And if your grandmother wouldn't know what the ingredient is like, yeah, it might not be that good for you. It's like, yeah, that, that kind of, you know, passes muster. So food rules by Michael Pollan is always one of my favorites uh, for that question. Cause I just think it's really common sense. And that's the thing, like performance nutrition. Yes, you're right. At the, at the tip end of the spear, there are some, you know, we, we employ a, a fantastic nutritionist and a um, holistic medicine doctor, because at the tip of the spear, there are some, you know, little intricacies that that can be manipulated and changed and individualized for people. But the 95% of it is exactly what healthy food should be for just about everybody. Right. And it's, it's, you know, it's plants and it's, you know, lean proteins and, and, you know, that kind of thing and not processed stuff. And at the end of the day, if that's what your plate looks like most of the time, then you're probably doing a pretty good job. Yeah. I appreciate that. Um, and I, I love those one page books. I used to read the daily stoic like that. And it was just kind yeah. of a, yeah. you know, how it is, it's a fast paced world out there. That's what gave, you know, so much success to convenient food in the first place. Um, and given someone who works in the world of efficiency, like you get it, people are, no one is in the line signing up saying, I want to be more busy and, and, you know, feel more self-conscious about the decisions I'm making in my life. It's like, all right, let's, let's try to, you know, peel the onion a little bit um, and, and make things easier for, for people. So I really appreciate that. I have two more questions, Dev. Um, I, I think you'll like where we're, where we're going to end up. I actually have a ton more questions, but we've done, um, you, you've been able to do a, a great job. I think capturing a lot of what I was hoping to, to gift our listener today. One is what is the most creative solution you have ever had to a training restriction? Uh, could be an injury, could be a lack of equipment. Um, what is the most creative solution you've ever had to a training restriction? That's a cool question. Um, something that pops into my mind right away is around measuring vertical jump. So a lot of times we'll use vertical jump um, and changes in a player's vertical jump over time as an indicator of, of fatigue. If you could jump, you know, 25 inches when you're fresh and today you walk in and it's 23, um, you know, it's a, it's a blunt instrument, but it's a way to say, Hey, something's going on. Um, and a colleague of mine uh, named Justin Smith worked at university of Vermont and they didn't have access to force plates or at the time, uh, you know, you know a, a jump mat or something to measure vertical jump in a really quick systemic way where their players could just come in and do this. And so they hung from the ceiling a, a bunch of, you know, maybe 10, um, 10 tennis balls on a string, all at like one inch increments. And you just jumped <laughs> and touched it. And if you always could touch the, the red one and today you couldn't, it was like, Hey, big change right there. And it took, you know, 10 pieces of rope and 10 tennis balls. So that was one of the most creative solutions around uh, a sports science issue that I thought, I thought was really smart. That is cool. I, and I think that's a lot of the premise of your whole industry, right? Is, um, and, and some of the beauty of, of being a coach, the, the responsibility of being a coach. Hey, I understand your problems. I understand your shortcomings, you know, physically, mentally, emotionally today, uh, resource wise, maybe not, we're not in the glitziest, you know, gym today. Maybe we're training in the Chicago Blackhawks road locker room, you know, which is like half, you know, covered with suits and things like that. Um, you know, or, or who else is a, a brutal road locker room? Uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs is like in a, a caged up hallway on, on right. concrete, right? Not ideal. Um, you know, but let's use what we can to be 1%, a half percent, 10% better today. Uh, and let's just make deposits in the different buckets that we can. And over the course of time, you know, I, I think you'll be really proud of your progress. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's it in a nutshell. If we can add up a 1% improvement, just 
you know, little doses over time, then ultimately we, we get this big, you know, improvement over time, which is what we're, that's development. That's what we're trying to do. It's about consistency and just, you know, going to work and making, being 1% better every day. And then uh final question, I, I, side note, I do have uh, quite a few Instagram responses to what we had today. So I'll send you some screenshots and any of them that you have time for, I'll, uh, you know, kind of tease it when we release the podcast. Um, but I want to tee you up with your favorite success story. Uh, when it comes to training, uh, who is one athlete, you know, one injury that a, pr- a player came back from one memory and you don't have to name them at all. Yeah. You know, um, but when you look over your years, you know, what's something that, that you're really proud of your work? Um, it's, it's, it's kind of a hard question for me because I always like, it's not my work, right? I, I, as a coach, like my job is just to, to, uh, to lead at the end of the day, it's to teach. Like, I believe coaching is teaching and it's leading. Um, I'll tell you this, actually the thing I'm maybe most proud of, um, from a sort of a, a accomplishment standpoint, um, is actually not it's not uh, specifically training related. So, and I don't know how well this would kind of work in, in the professional setting, but when I worked at Lowell, um, there was a, a year where, you know, we, we were, we prided ourselves on our culture there and um, we were, had some great success and, and um, it was a, a big piece of it was because of the culture that our head coach and our program developed. And, and I was fortunate to be a part of that. And there was a point in time where it, for whatever reason, it, it, things didn't work one year and it just didn't work the way we expected it. And we kind of went back to the drawing board a little bit. And one of the areas that we identified as a program that, that we missed the boat on was, was leadership development. We were expecting these guys to come up and, you know, follow in the footsteps of the previous captains and leaders and become leaders. And we realized, well, we didn't, we didn't teach them how to lead. Like it's a skill set. It's, it's something you can learn. And so one of the things that, I was really proud of that took off was we called it, I called it a leadership library. And it was literally like, I read, I read a lot and I, you know, had read all these books and um, I said, you know what? Like our players were hungry to learn how to lead. Like we actually identified this in a postseason questionnaire. Like they wanted to learn how, like, how do I lead? What do I, I don't know what to do. And so we put this leadership library together in our weight room and basically players could check a book out. And, but the only, the caveat was that they had to, they had to write a couple notes on it and then they had to share that with the group. They had to teach the group what they learned from, they had to do a book report basically. And I was like, all right, this, you know, two or three kids, you know, that were, you know, really, really sharp, smart academic kids and kind of interested in this. They'll do it. They'll read the book and we'll have a little chat about it. It'll be cool. Be, you know, we'll nerd out in my office. This turned into the entire team, like full on doing like, book reports, like 10 page book reports. Like it was absurd. There's a player in the New York Rangers organization right now that played for us. Um, who, I mean, he, he like multiple book reports and it was all about like helping each other learn how to be better leaders. And that's probably one of the most, um, one of the best accomplishments when I think about my time so far in this industry is, is, uh, being able to, um, help those players and help that group um, do something a little bit outside the box that they really took to and really appreciated. Um, and whether it had anything to do with any future successes, I have no idea, but it was kind of a cool, a cool organic thing that happened um, when I worked in that setting that that was really fun. You know, anything's most special about that too, is there was no, there's no clearing of time or energy for these kids to do this. Oh, and no. I was a student yeah. athlete. I know how busy I was. There was no lower class load. Oh no, they'll only take 12 credits this, this year. Cause we want to make sure they have time for the leadership library. There was no, you know, maybe I'll erase, you know, about 40 minutes worth of, of training post game on Saturday, you know, Saturday nights or whatever. Uh, so these guys, you know, this is allocated reading time. Um, this is on top of a full division one student athlete schedule. Um, and it, I think it's a, a beautiful use of resources. If you want it, you can go get it. And I, I also think it's kind of a nod to just a, a, a sobering fact that clearly there was a hunger for this type of skill acquisition that wasn't provided elsewhere. 
It yeah. had to be purposefully sought yeah. out. And that's not so much a critique as much as it is just an acknowledgement of the facts um, based on what actually happened, the behavior. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, in that, in that very specific example, like I've, I, I didn't know this, I didn't realize this, but yeah, our players, it wasn't that they, they didn't want to be leaders or didn't want to lead. They didn't know how <laughs> they, 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 nobody had ever, nobody had ever explained just the skills around, you know, leading a group, having tough conversations, like any of these things. And, um, yeah, it was, it was really, it was kind of a neat experience. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Dev, I don't want to keep you too long. Um, I appreciate all your work. I, I, I appreciate your time today. Uh, I loved working together as a, as a devil. Neither of us are there now. Um, you know, but, uh, we had a good time when we did. I, I wish you all the best in Arizona. Take care of, uh, I think I know a couple guys on that team, but definitely Andrew Ladd. Um, you know, who I'm hoping to have on the podcast at some point. And then, uh, Liam O'Brien, uh, ex roommate of mine as a, as a Hershey bear. So say hi to those guys for me uh, and be well. And, and, uh, I hope you're doing well, man, otherwise. And and I appreciate you catching up. Well, this was awesome, man. I appreciate it. You're one of my favorite guys of all time. So even if this doesn't make the cut, I'm I'm glad we could spend an hour chatting. It's, It's been good to see you again and good to talk shop, man. Awesome. Thanks, Steph. All right, buddy.